Okay, so in the previous video, uh, we gave like a big picture idea of uh, um, how the electron transport chain um, is coupled to ATP synthase and it allows us to take the electrons from NADH and FADH2 and ultimately create this proton gradient or this electrochemical gradient, which ATP synthase then uses uh, to, or harnesses to then make ATP. Um, maybe I should instead of page five over here, I should put ATP synthase, but some people just put complex five. So I'm just gonna put ATP synthase. Okay, so the idea here again is that we're making that, that proton gradients and then ATP synthase requires it. And we also came to the conclusion that the electron transport chain produces the pH gradient, that ATP synthase requires for function, but then also that ATP synthase dissipates that pH gradient allowing the electron transport chain to continue to function, meaning that they need each other, okay? So now what we're gonna be doing is I'm going to take you through each of the complexes and how everything works. Um, and uh, I kind of color coded this. So again, to orient you guys, we have the outer membrane over here, the inner membrane space over here, and the mitochondrial matrix, okay? So going back to this drawing over here, so again, we have the outer membrane right over here, then we have the inner membrane or the second membrane, and then we have the mitochondrial matrix here, okay? So I'm just kind of taking a slice of it. And remember, I'm only gonna be showing you one like series of electron transport chain uh, complexes, but there's gonna be multiple of these throughout all of the inner membrane. And um, that's kind of like why, like there's such a larger, there's a, like if you look over here, there's a, a higher surface area of the inner membrane is because you're basically increasing uh, the surface area of the inner membrane so you can have more electron transport chain complexes and more ATP synthase so that you can make more ATP. And I guess if you want to like remember it is like that's why we say like the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell is because we're going to have all these foldings in the and they're called cristae but the idea here is that these folds help us create a larger surface area so that we can undergo a larger amount of oxidative phosphorylation, okay? And something else I just remembered that I, I wanna point out because I don't think I mentioned in the last video, um, I wanna contrast oxidative phosphorylation versus substrate level phosphorylation, okay? So um, anything in glycolysis in the TCA, we're gonna say that this is substrate level phosphorylation, okay? So this is substrate level phosphorylation. And all this means is that our substrate um, is going to be a higher energy intermediate and it's going to then be able to transfer the phosphate from that, from the, it's going to be able to transfer the phosphate from the substrate to ADP to form ATP. Okay, so it's substrate level phosphorylation. To contrast this, now we also have this idea of oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so the electron transport chain uses oxidative phosphorylation. And we're gonna explain this oxidative phosphorylation. Okay? And we're gonna explain why this is uh, in a little bit, but the idea here again is that we're oxidizing NADH and our terminal electron acceptor, the last thing that accepts those electrons from NADH is oxygen. And we're gonna, as we're passing those electrons, we're gonna form that we're gonna phosphorylate AT, ADP to form ATP. So it's oxidative phosphorylation because it's using oxygen. Okay, so key idea here is that if you don't have oxygen, you cannot undergo oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so now let's go to uh, the actual electron transport chain and go over the different complexes. Okay, so I wrote out the uh, different names of the complexes over here. Complex one is NADH coenzyme Q oxidoreductase, and you can read the names. But I want you guys to know that I color coded this as a specific way, and let me maybe also bring this a little bit further in so you guys can see it all on one screen because I can't zoom out anymore. So like this, and hopefully you'll be able to see everything now. Okay, yeah, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over each of the complexes and the red, so I, I you, you can look at the color coding, the red is the tracking of the flow of electrons through the complexes and then the blue or the light blue is, is referring to the protons being pumped from the mitochondrial matrix into the IMS, okay? And again, we're gonna have a lower pH or a higher H concentration of H plus ions in IMS, and we're gonna have a higher pH in the matrix, 
or in other words, a lower concentration of H plus ions because we're continually, the electron transport chain is continually pumping protons against this concentration gradient into the inner membrane space, okay? So um, I guess what we can do first is start off with complex one and then we'll go through the flow of electrons and we'll go through complex one and two, three, four, and then we'll show how this all connects to make ATP. Um, I'm still not sure if I'll put the Q cycle in this video or if I'll make its video for its, by itself, but I guess we'll see how it goes or how long it's taking based on what, what I'm doing here. Okay, so again, we're gonna get our NADH. Remember, we're gonna get our NADH from glycolysis in the TCA cycle. And what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna oxidize the NADH into NAD plus, and we're gonna take those electrons and pass it through complex one. Now, NADH, okay, it's going to transfer its electrons in the form of a hydride, okay? And um, the idea here behind a hydride, it's like a hydrogen atom with two electrons, okay? So it's an obligate two electron transfer. So Flavin mononucleotide is going to accept those two electrons and then it's going to pass it to iron sulfur clusters within complex one. Now, I want to emphasize the importance of flavin mononucleotide and explain what role it plays. And the idea here is that you can think of it like this. Well, NADH has, it's an obligate two electron transfer. It has to donate those two electrons in the form of a hydride, okay? And the iron sulfur, the iron sulfur clusters can only accept and donate one electron at a time. Well, if this donates two electrons and this can only accept one electron at a time, you're gonna probably need something that can bridge the two of them. And flavin mononucleotide is exactly the thing that bridges the two electron um, donor of NADH to the one electron acceptor of the iron sulfur clusters, okay? So FMN is gonna accept those two electrons and then one at a time, it's gonna pass them to the iron sulfur cluster. So it's gonna do this twice, okay? Maybe I should erase this, okay? It's gonna pass them and it's gonna pass each electron individually to different iron sulfur clusters and they're gonna be passed along um, the, the, it's gonna be passed along and eventually get to coenzyme Q. Now the idea here is as we're, pa pa so this is, this region of complex one is called the peripheral arm, okay? It's like the, the it's the portion that, it's, it, it's kind of standing out and pointing into the mitochondrial matrix. This is the transmembrane region and this is the part that's within the inner membrane, okay? so. As we're passing those electrons um, through the iron sulfur clusters, remember we said that movement of electrons yields an electric current and we're gonna use that electric current to power something that's unfavorable. And what we're gonna be doing is as those electrons are being passed through the iron sulfur clusters, it's going to trigger these things or these ideas called proton wires, okay? It's gonna trigger proton wires. And you're gonna learn about this in lecture and you're, it's gonna, you're gonna see it on your study questions a lot. But the idea here, and I'll just read off the definition from the study questions. Um, the idea here is that it is the, so uh, the electron transfer in the peripheral arm causes a conformational change in the proton uh, wires to activate those proton wires. So you have a conformational change that activates the proton wires. And then you're gonna have the non-sequential protonations and deprotonations of amino acid side chains causing the net translocation from the mitochondrial matrix into the IMS. You're gonna, you're gonna have the electrons move through the iron sulfur clusters. It's gonna cause a conformational change in your proton wires. And because you're gonna have those con that conformational change in your proton wires, your protons are gonna basically be able to be transported from the mitochondrial matrix into the IMS, okay? And the way that it works is that you're gonna have different amino acid side chains. So um, you're gonna see it in lecture, but it's kind of like you have different amino acids and they have R groups. And those protons, it's not, the same proton's not gonna be passed from one side to the other. It's like this, this proton comes over here and then a, this proton that was here is gonna get passed over here and then this one's gonna get passed over here and then this one's gonna get passed to a different side chain. And then because you have this non-sequential uh, protonation and deprotonation of amino acid side chains, you're gonna get one proton that gets onto the other side, and you're gonna for and you're gonna have a total of four protons at the end of this process through proton wires be able to be transported from the mitochondrial matrix into the IMS. Okay, so now uh, so we got four protons from complex one. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go and pass them onto coenzyme Q. And I'm going to actually leave the next video. I'm going to put the, the Q cycle in another video because it's going to take too long. But the idea here is that, okay, 
we pass those two electrons from FMN, which then can pass, which can pass it on one at a time to the iron sulfur clusters. And then coenzyme Q, what it's going to do is it can pick up those electrons and it picks up two electrons actually. Okay. It'll be able to pick up two electrons. And as it picks up those two electrons, it's going to also be able to pick up two protons. So if I'm drawing this right. It's going to form two protons. So as it takes those two electrons and two protons, it becomes its reduced form of CoQH2. Okay. And then it's going to, it's your coenzyme Q is your mobile electron carrier. It's your lipophilic and lipophilic means that it's just hydrophobic and you know, it's hydrophobic because it's within your inner membrane. So, so that your lipophilic electron carrier, it's going to, uh, and it's a mobile carrier. It's going to take your electrons from complex one to complex three, where it's going to pass those electrons. It's going to be oxidized and then pass those protons through complex three into the IMS. Okay. But this is part of the Q cycle and we'll talk about that in a future video. But the idea here with coenzyme Q, it's lipophilic, it's mobile, and it's, it's going to transfer your electrons not only from complex one, but it can also do the same thing from complex two and transport them to complex three, where you're going to continue on with the electron transport chain and also pump four protons through the Q cycle. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a future video, how that works, but that's the idea. Okay, now complex two, again, we said that it's going to pass its own electrons to coenzyme, a, a different coenzyme Q, which can also then uh, transfer them to complex three. But the, I, I wanted to also point out that you might notice that this reaction is very familiar. And the reason why it's familiar is because this is actually succinate dehydrogenase. This is from the TCA cycle. So a lot of students, and I, I didn't really understand this until um, I TA this a few times, but um, succinate dehydrogenase, which is that enzyme which we saw in the TCA cycle, right? It's physically located within complex two of your electron transport chain, okay? So succinate is gonna be oxidized into fumarate and FAD is your prosthetic group. It's gonna be converted, it's gonna be reduced into FADH2 and you're gonna get two electrons on FADH2 and what it's gonna do is it's gonna be, it's gonna then pass it onto its own iron sulfur clusters. So what uh, FADH2 then does is it can transfer those electrons uh, one at a time to the iron sulfur clusters. And then coenzyme Q can then take it from complex two and go to uh, complex three through the Q cycle and you pump protons again, okay? So again, complex one and two both eventually give their uh, electrons to coenzyme Q and then that passes it through complex three. Um, and it's in its name as well. So that's why you see coenzyme Q on the receiving end. Remember if we're talking about how we uh, name our enzymes. This is the electron donor. This is the electron acceptor. Okay. So coenzyme Q, both for complex one and complex two, accepts your electrons and then passes it on to complex three. Okay. Notice again, and this is a key thing. Notice how complex two, it on its own does not pump any protons. It, it pumps zero protons. And we'll talk about why this is. And it has to do with like the delta G associated with its electron transfers, which is not favorable enough to um, pump protons. But again, complex one pumps four protons through proton wires. Complex two pumps zero protons through zero protons um, through no means whatsoever. Okay. So now we have coenzyme Q, which has those electrons, and it'll go through the Q cycle, which I'll talk about in a different video. But I'm just trying to show you the flow of electrons. Okay. So coenzyme Q again, it's uh, in this form. It's the uh, it's it's going to get reduced to CoQH2, and then again we're going to oxidize coenzyme Q back on the the IMS side, right? We're right over here, what we're doing is we're oxidizing it over here and we're passing its electrons to cytochrome C. Okay, so now cytochrome C take those, takes those electrons and what it does, and cytochrome C can only accept one electron at a time. So, uh, and this is why it's important that we have the Q cycle, which we'll talk about in a future video. But the idea here is that cytochrome C can only accept one electron at a time. Coenzyme Q has two electrons. So one of those electrons is going to be recycled, and we'll talk about that. But um, then cytochrome C will then pass those electrons through complex four, and um, it's going to go through complex four, and your terminal electron acceptor uh, is going to be oxygen. So you need oxygen to take those electrons and then be reduced into water. And in the process, as, as electrons are being passed through complex four, you're also going to activate proton wires on this one. On complex four. So you're going to activate proton wires on this. And again, 
you're gonna, as you're passing those electrons, you're gonna cause a conformational change in the proton wires, and then that causes the net trans, it's gonna activate the proton wires to cause the net translocation of protons from the mitochondrial matrix into the IMS. Um, and in this process, you're gonna only have two protons pumped. Um, and then because you pumped all these protons against this concentration gradient, and you have a higher concentration of protons in IMS, ATP synthase will then use that electrochemical gradient and it's going to power ATP synthase. Okay, so we're gonna then use that electrochemical gradient to power ATP synthase and we're gonna then create ATP. Okay, so a uh, key thing that a lot of students make a mistake on on their final, okay, complexes one and four both use proton wires, okay, Complex one pumps four protons. Complex four only pumps two protons. Um, complex two does not pump any protons. And then complex three uses the Q cycle to pump its proton. And this is a redox loop, which we'll talk about in the next video or actually right now. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to say in this video. Um, and I don't think so, but yeah, that's it.